let's get started. I want to introduce to you Jonathan Alexander. Jonathan is a Chancellor's Professor of English and Education and Gender and Sexual Studies. Sexuality. Sexuality Studies. Right. Or Sexual Studies. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, he's also the Director of the Center for Excellence in Writing and Communications and the Campus Writing Coordinator. So I knew him like seven, eight years ago initially when I was on a campus-wide committee to look at the undergraduate writing program here. And you should know, there's probably no undergraduates here, it's an excellent program because it's customized to each student, having a test coming in and then figuring out which of the courses they have to take to succeed. So this is the guy that does that as well. Um, but I also, in talking with him, realized he has very interesting uh, production of material. I'll leave it loose like that because one of them is a book on rhetoric and this is its cover and this is what it looks like inside. So it's a graphic book about rhetoric. Think about that. So this is him, right, and this is Liz Losh, his co-author, and they appear in the book in various places explaining rhetoric and what you're trying to do. It's a cool book. I was going to bring the actual book but it turns out I lent it to somebody and it never came back. It was so good. Somebody said, oh, <laughs> now I have this. <laughs> All right, so that's Jonathan. Uh, we're delighted to have him here for the Friday seminar. Um, uh, join me in welcoming him. Thank you very much. Do I have to turn this on, by the way? Yeah. Okay. Yes, just sure. right on the top. Right on the top. All right, well, this is going to get complicated. I think I've already ensnared myself. Oh. Nope, I did not. Oh, good. On. Yes, <laughs> Perfect. Thanks again, Jay, and to my colleagues in the Department of Informatics. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I actually gave a talk in this seminar series during my first year here, and I'm sorry that Bonnie Nardi isn't here because uh, uh, she was the one who had uh, helped me set up the talk, and I talked about uh, Jean Cocteau, who's an uh, important uh, French multimedia artist. Uh, and I'm curiously not going to be talking about another writer in French today, so I feel like it's a weird sort of homecoming nearly a decade later. But anyway, I do appreciate the opportunity to talk about some ideas that I have been working on for some time uh, in the history and what I'm going to call the genealogy of virtuality as a concept. Now, a couple of disclaimers. I am a humanist, so I tend to work with narrative objects, uh, fiction, uh, and other kinds of narrative media. And so a lot of the work that I look at is going to be based in fictional representations of the virtual. Uh, I also told Judy that it is fairly common for people in the humanities to read their papers. Uh, I'm not gonna read my entire paper, but I might read parts of it uh, because our methods rely often on close readings of our objects. And I wanna make sure that I get the reading actually right, or at least get right my reading of the object. Uh, but there are a lot of places that we could begin talking about virtuality. And I think it's important to kind of mark this as a moment in the continuing development of virtuality as a broad set of objects of study, uh, you know, kind of the proliferation of different kinds of headsets certainly retunes our thinking about what virtuality is. For a while, I thought that the concept of the virtual was going to potentially go away. like cyberspace, if you remember that word, uh, or even the information superhighway. Sometimes I'll talk about these things with my students and they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, you know, there are older words that we use to describe a uh, range of kinds of digital communications technologies and experiences. But, but these headsets have at least, I think, done a lot to resuscitate a certainly popular interest in notions of the virtual. And as Bonnie Nardi has said, even just recently, Without question, life is increasingly lived virtually. In fact, so compelling can these projects become, participation in different kinds of virtual worlds, that participants may be devastated by the closing of a game or migrate with the denizens of a closed world to new worlds. Uh, if any of you are massively multiple online, Game players, you understand that I migrated a few times in the course of my life. Uh, but I was struck by Bonnie's comment about devastation, devastated by the closing of a game or of a virtual space, uh, a virtual community. And in fact, it brought me back to one of the primary objects of study I want to talk a little, a little bit about today later in the talk, which is the film Avatar. How many of you saw Avatar? 
I assume in this crowd, most everybody. Uh, this is a really interesting film, and I was very pleased to be able to see it uh, in IMAX 3D, uh, in which, I don't know if you, if you go, we, we tend to only want to go to, to movies in, in IMAX when, when we can. Uh, they advertise it as a fully immersive experience, and I don't know how immersive it actually is, but you know, you're in a big screen, the music is pounding, the sheet potentially rattles at times because of the sonic vibration, so yeah, it's, it's getting there. Uh, Avatar was certainly that kind of experience for a lot of people. In fact, so many people reported leaving the theater after seeing Avatar feeling, to borrow Nardi's, uh, Nardi's word, devastated because they realized they were returning to a world that wasn't as nearly as rich and as beautiful and as vibrant and as interesting as the world of Avatar itself. So like Jake, they would wake up from their trip to uh, the land of the Navi and return to their day jobs and report feeling depressed, less less lively in their less vibrant world. Psychologists even developed a name for this, post-avatar depression had, <laughs> swear to God, a real thing that people were documenting at the time. And that got me really curious about this film uh, as a kind of virtually immersive experience, but also itself as a film that somewhat engages issues of virtuality. Uh, if you remember the film, uh, Jake and his other human companions have to assume the, the bodies are sort of ported into their consciousnesses, ported into the bodies of uh, the alien the Navi, uh, and have various adventures on their home world that we will talk about in due time. But I began thinking about the sort of devastatedness of people's reactions to this film, and began wondering with uh, Michael Hine, and this is a very old understanding, a very old attempt to, to think about virtuality. The virtual reality is not a state of consciousness or a simulated drug trip. This is Michael Hine writing you know, uh, after the 70s and 80s. Virtual reality is an emerging field of applied science. But because virtual reality belongs to contemporary culture, it expresses and reinforces many of the broad experiences we share as members of a common culture. Our culture intentionally fuses, sometimes even confuses, the artificial with the real and the fabricated with the natural. As a result, we tend to quickly gloss over the precise meaning of virtual reality and apply the term virtual to many experiences of contemporary life. And that certainly is one of the problematics of dealing with the virtual conceptually. What do we mean by it? I was drawn to uh, Heim's initial thinking about virtuality in part because uh, he seemed to capture a sense of at least what was happening with PAD, post-avatar depression, uh, this confusion of the artificial with the real, uh, the confusion of the fabricated with the natural, and people sense that the natural world somehow ours doesn't quite fully measure up. What is the operation of the virtual humanistically and existentially then? in creating different kinds of experiences, perhaps ones that can subjectively, uh, phenomenologically at least, make the real, the natural, as we experience it here, seem less than. For humanists, those are really interesting questions. Now, methodologically, a lot of ways to study the virtual. I know several of you partake in these kinds of analyses. Theoretical studies, kind of debating what is virtual, what is not. Empirical studies, uh, which could include participant observation. You know, I myself have done a lot of ethnographic and autoethnographic work in different kinds of MMORPGs. Uh, attention to media and platforms. Platform studies themselves becoming very important, thinking about the different kinds of boxes and software is that generate virtual experiences, but also interrogation of corporate structures. What are the economics uh, and the political economies of the experience of virtuality, of the creation of virtual spaces, and then the tracing of large global networks? I'm going to focus primarily on what I call a genealogical understanding of virtuality. And if I follow, follow in a lot of ways the work of Lisa Geidelman, uh, who is an historian of new media. And she says that the introduction of new media is never entirely revolutionary. New media are less points of epistemic rupture than they are socially embedded sites for the ongoing negotiations of meaning. Comparing and contrasting new media thus stand to offer a view of negotiability in itself, a view that is of the contested relations of force that determine the pathways by which new media may eventually become old hat. And so part of what Gadolin is trying to get at 
is to debunk the notion that every time a new platform is announced, every time we get a new box or a new piece of software that generates something like a virtual or immersive experience, that we are not, in fact, experiencing something totally new. We are, in fact, bringing to that platform, to that software, to that experience, a range of different kinds of concepts, ways of imagining, and ways of thinking about what we are doing and what we are experiencing. And that is important for all of us media theorists and people who work with information and think about media to take a longer view of what kinds of experiences shape and what kinds of concepts shape our interaction with immersive virtuality, to take just one item. Now, if I think about Gettleman, and if I think about the history of virtuality, and if I think about a genealogy of virtual media, one place we could start is with Wagnerian opera. And I start there, not just because I'm an opera fan, but because the composer, Richard Wagner, in the late 19th century, attempted to create, and he actually built his own opera house to stage his five-hour operas, uh, that would approximate a kind of immersion that would get people as immersed as possible in their, uh, in his storytelling. Uh, sort of music, sound effects, light effects, uh, couldn't actually make things move, but you might notice it's hard to see. The orchestra is way, way out of sight down here. And so he arranged the uh, theater, the sort of uh, stadium, so that people would get as close as possible to the actual stage. And a lot of media theorists cite this opera house as one of the first large-scale immersive spaces in which there's an attempt to get people fully involved in as much as they could in a theatrical experience. Now, there are other options. We could work with um, Warhase's notion of the universal library, it's a massive fictional place in which Borges imagines a comprehensive library uh, of the world's knowledge, or one of my favorites, the Sensorama, which is an actual thing designed. It looks kind of like an arcade machine uh, in which you can sit in it, see a film, uh, apparently in 3D with wide vision. Not entirely sure what that is. I think it's wide vision because you're sort of encased by the, 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 uh, the screen system. It's in color, which is good. Stereo sound, aromas, <laughs> wind, and vibrations. You might notice the seat will allow you to experience some vibrations. I was always curious about the wind as well. Puffs of air could be, uh, could be thrust at you. Uh, and then, of course, smells. That always seemed sketchy to me. So there are a lot of places that we could go to think about this long history of virtually immersive experiences. Uh, and I think it's important to think about, and I'm going to limit myself to talking specifically about immersive virtuality, because I think that that gives us a real sharp sense of what's interesting about the virtual. And I follow McKinsey work in the sense that it is not the reality in virtual reality that matters. It's the virtual. And what is virtual in virtual reality? Not its mimetic qualities, but its potential to pass through and go beyond mimesis, or imitation. The possibility of creating new worlds. Think virtual and the expression of virtual reality quickly comes to mind. This rhetoric and technology that creates an immersive, three-dimensional environment within which a user can move and look at things. So with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and start with an 1884 novel by the Belgian writer J.K. Huissement. And it's a novel called A Rebours, which is often translated in French to against nature, sometimes against the grain. Now, almost all of you, I believe, saw Avatar. Anybody read A Rebours? Clearly not. This is not a book necessarily that a lot of people outside of increasingly few departments of French will have any experience of. And yet, it remains for historians of virtuality an extremely important novel in the development of, or at least the conceptualization of immersive virtuality. So much so that some of you might remember Mondo 2000 and Are You Serious? One of the early uh, proto bloggers and web designers who claimed that Huisman's Arbor is an extremely important precursor to immersive virtuality. It's a relatively simple story, and actually, for a 200 page book, it's kind of boring even. But it's about uh, a rather, uh, how should we put it, degenerate young man who decides that he's just bored with life. He's relatively wealthy, 
Uh, he has sampled multiple different kinds of pleasures, but he has exhausted what he thinks of as the experiences of life. And so he says the only thing that he can think of to do now is to actually artificially create his own environments for his pleasure. So he rents out an apartment and doesn't just rent it out, he decks it out. He completely redoes the interior of this apartment. Each room has its own theme. There's sort of the Arabian room, and then there is the African room, and then there is the jungle room, and each of these is uh, decked out with all sorts of paintings, all sorts of, not just paintings, but sounds. Uh, he's able to funnel in different kinds of sounds. He uh, outfits his kitchen as a galley, a ship's galley. And since his apartment uh, is fully his, he actually will fill up water behind the windows uh, so that it looks like you were looking out through the window onto, into the ocean. And those become aquaria. Uh, actually, as fish and other kinds of moving objects in those different aquaria. So many media theorists think about Arbor as an attempt to create an artificial environment, in fact, a virtually immersive environment. And so this particular character, his name is Dessaisson, decides he doesn't want to be in the real world anymore. He wants to actually live fully an artificial life. And it was a shocking novel at the time because it seemed to reject not only nature, uh, but just sort of Civilization said so that what one can do, what maybe what one should do if you have sufficient funds, is to create your own completely artificial environments. I think it's intriguing to think about Arabor and Avatar, uh, both in this regard, in the sense that Arabor is about a young man completely dissatisfied and bored, suffers from what the French would famously call ennui, bored with life retreats to a completely virtual environment, a totally artificially created space. It's the inverse of what happens with post-avatar depression, people experiencing the film, leaving it, and then becoming depressed because the real world just can't quite measure up to the artificial wonders that we can create virtually. So I want to think about Arabor a little bit more. Uh, here are some of the paintings that inspired Hui Small by uh, contemporary artists Odilon Redon. You'll see in some of these rather famous paintings, use of natural figures and uh, objects, but they're all made aestheticized. Uh, and so we're looking at 1880s, 1890s, movement into what uh, art historians call the decadence, uh, or art for art's sake, uh, but also the fantastical. Uh, one of Radon's most famous paintings, uh, and a reinfusion of the natural world with the symbolic. Uh, this is around the same time that photography is just starting to take off. And those of you who know of the history of photography know that uh, photographs did a world of good for artists in terms of unleashing them from the raw representation of nature to thinking more and more about interior landscapes, psychic projections. Uh, onto the natural world. Uh, Gustave Moreau, another important artist that we saw, uh, was influenced by, uh, we get not only sort of the mythic, but also the supernatural, uh, create, uh, the sort of reinvestment interest in artificially created mythic landscapes. Some of these gesturing to, to mythology, but then creation of whole new mythologies. And so what's interesting about Hui Simon in Arabor, for me in terms of the long history of virtuality, is that he's writing about an immersive artificial experience right at the moment when we're able to begin to make some interesting separations between nature and the artificial, uh, naturalism, which is a very important art movement at the time, and aestheticism, uh, and science and artifice. So right at the moment at the rise of, at least in the history of literature, the uh, realist novel, you have a whole, such as Dickens, for instance, you have a whole set of other artists, uh, including Louis Mont, who are breaking away and saying, no, that in fact, what our works of art should do is create art completely artificial environments for people to imagine into. And the work of art should not be about the representation of reality per se, but more specifically about imaginative production and fantasy. People who held to realism 
uh, and to naturalism, such as Dickens, but then also Emile Zola and other novelists, were very much interested in science. They were very interested in the creation of realistic kinds of environments and portrayals of realism so that they could test and see how different characters reacted in those uh, artificial, in those in particular environments. So it's a kind of uh, empiricism, sort of fictional empiricism, kind of a scientific novelization. Uh, and that contrasts very much with what people like Guizman were attempting to do, saying, no, we should not be interested or invested in the real, but in fact, in things that are artificial. Now, I think it's important that Guizman begins uh, his own assault on realism and naturalism, and even on science itself, with uh, privileging a fantasy uh, and imagination with a book that essentially is about a virtual environment and an immersive virtual environment. Uh, because we can then, from 1884, trace out all of the different kinds of influences that have been borne out sent from Arbor all the way to a piece like Avatar. And so that's what I want to do fairly quickly. So if I have a thesis, it's basically this, that the virtual is the space, the space in which our conceptualization of an investment in the relations amongst the natural, the scientific, the aesthetic, and the artificial are potentially most mobile. And they're potentially most legible in that mobility. That what we can actually see in the long history of virtuality is a real deep and abiding concern with the questions, what is natural? What is artificial? How do science and technology give us opportunities to explore both our understanding of the natural, but then also of what is artificial? And what is the relationship between the artificial and the natural? And by the time we get to the end of the talk in about half an hour, I think we will hopefully see some of these problems and questions play out in a film like Avatar. But first, let's take a couple of detours. So Huisma, whom I spent a little bit of time talking about, is interesting to me, not only for creating one of the first really interesting fictional versions of an artificial reality, but also because he had a huge influence on a lot of different writers uh, at the time, including a man named Kurt Lossfitz, who was an important science fiction writer in Germany. And uh, Lossfitz is important because he then gives us the key uh, to uh, the development of American science fiction, and I'll trace that out. But I want to spend a little, just a couple of minutes working with Kurt Lossfitz, in part because he's not only a figure who doesn't get a lot of attention anymore, and I, I'm sort of interested in these forgotten figures, but also because he is this important hinge figure. And his absolutely fascinating story, The Absolute Zero of Existence, a story from 2371, it's kind of an interesting case in point. And so I'll read you just a little bit about this, this bizarre story. It's emblematic of much of the work. And then it plays out the conflict between a scientific and an aesthetic view of the world, very much just like Huisman had tried to do. There's sort of a scientific world, and we can understand it in its empirical reality, or we can understand it as a pure flight of fancy and create these imaginative scapes, uh, landscapes. And so much of the action of this story focuses on the intellectual and intimate tensions among a group of friends. They are Amorosia Sintius Ozodis, who's a widely esteemed artist and performer on the odor chord, a small piano producing synthetic symphonies of smells, her friend Magnet Reimert Overtone, a poet who blends romantic verse with scientific terms and processes, and then her love interest, my favorite, Oxygen Warm Bubble, a technician who works as a weather manufacturer. So this is set in the, in the future in which we have odor chords, uh, pianos that stink, and weather manufacturing. Uh, so Amorosia and Oxygen represent flip sides of the aesthetic scientific coin, with Amorosia focusing on the production of artificial environments, of sound and smell, and Oxygen using science and technology to control natural forces, improving them by shaping the weather to human requirements. Now, curiously, Amorosia's smell art is reminiscent of Vesesan, who's the character in Arabor, and his own experiments with the creation of different smells and his attempt to link them synesthetically with sound and the creation of complex artificial sensations and what I call smellscapes. Tension mounts, though, because these young friends eventually disagree about the importance of art, with oxygen extolling the virtues of the rise of science. 
hear his name, oxygen, science, and its understanding of and eventual control over nature and even human nature, he argues, how would, it have, how would it have been possible for all levels of society to enjoy the advantages of civilization had science not put the forces of nature at our service and got them to perform the mechanical labor to such an extent that everyone can live a decent life? I think several of us are still waiting for that to happen. <laughs> So a scientific understanding of natural processes allows scientists to control them even better. And this rather naturalistic view ushers in an era of rationalism and control, equally influencing and directing ecology and economics. Provocatively, Oxygen goes on to assert that there eventually will be less and less need for artists whose work is producing and invoking sensations will be taken over by physiologists. So, Eventually, there will be just no need for art. Science will control everything, even how we feel. The friends quarrel and part. In a rather melodramatic turn of events, Amorosia and Magnet, her lover, decide to get even with oxygen by mocking his views through the public media, the early form of social media, flaming. Oxygen retaliates by sabotaging Aramasia's uh, order cord to produce nasty smells. Bad scientist. In a completely unexpected turn of events, however, the instrument malfunctions and kills her during a performance. Oxygen flees in despair, traveling to the far reaches of the galaxy, while the story concludes with Magnet eulogizing him and Aramasia. Ever the poet, he offers art as the primary, maybe the only modality that could possibly reconcile the aesthetic realm and the realm of nature and scientific reimagining or reengineering of it. Now, Magnet, you can actually hear in his name, right? He, he's an attractor. He's a, an appropriate figure of reconciliation here, and that he brings together different opposites. And so Lossowitz is very much attempting to try to come to some reconciliation. He doesn't want to hold to Huisman's view that art and science and nature need necessarily always be separate, so they can be joined. But in this story, which is about the production of various kinds of virtual experiences, such as the weird odor cord, or even the creation of different kinds of weather patterns, we have an attempt to make some reconciliations. Those reconciliations, though, don't necessarily hold pat. Lasswitz was a huge influence on Hugo Gernsback, who actually not only invented the term science fiction, but was one of the most important early editors of science fiction in the United States. And Gernsback not only translated a lot of Les, uh, Leswitz's work, but borrowed many of his ideas and adapted them, including this fixation on the battle between the aesthetic art and science and nature. And in fact, one of my arguments about the long history of science fiction in this country is that we can trace out that as a primary binary battle Art, the aesthetic, nature, science, and technology as battling each other in a lot of early science fiction works. And I can archivally and genealogically trace that to the influence of Gernsback on early American science fiction and is having essentially borrowed these ideas and been influenced by Lasswitz, who in turn was influenced by Huisman. Now you understand what I mean by genealogy. I mean actual tracing out of different patterns of thought. I'm going to spend a little bit of time with Gernsback because he's a freaking kooky figure, as you can tell. Uh, and his uh, most interesting novel, um, not science and mechanics, although you can kind of see his emphasis is one of the uh, uh, periodicals that he edited. But his novel, Ralph, One to Foresee for One Plus. This is a pun. You can hear it. One to foresee for one. One to foresee for one. So this is about an attempt to foresee into the future what is going to be happening. Uh, and so it's a novel in which uh, Gernsback tries to prognosticate the, all of the different kinds of inventions that will be made and will make the future interesting. So in the, the plot of the novel, Ralph, One, Two, Foresee for One Plus, is relatively simple. We have a world famous scientist who through his scientific skill and technological and ingenuity saves the life of a young woman. So it's the inverse plot of, uh, of Lasswitz's story. Uh, this young woman, uh, Alice, she, she saves her from a, a freak avalanche, uh, and Ralph quickly becomes infatuated with her and pursues a relationship. An evil Martian, however, is equally obsessed with her and kidnaps her, but Ralph, super scientist, is able to save the day. And over the course of the book, 
we learn much about the technologically enabled wonders of tomorrow. And indeed, the entire book is often in this sort of really kind of silly background romance plot. The book is really most interesting for a whole series of what we would call info dumps, or just these sort of long catalogs and descriptions of future technologies. Um, so what's interesting about the book in that regard is that not only do we get a lot of future prognostication, but how Gernsback characterizes those future technologies becomes really interesting. If Lasovitz hinted at the potential reconciliation between nature and art and the aesthetic, Gernsback is totally behind the scientist. And he sides much more with a character, for instance, like oxygen. That is, what we see in Ralph 1 to 4C for 1 plus, and in much subsequent science fiction in the 40s and 50s, is an attempt to meet the determining forces of the natural with greater and greater scientific control, just like oxygen controls the weather in the Lossfit story. The emphasis is in much of this steadily shifts from contemplating the natural versus the aesthetic to considering how to subjugate the natural world and bend it to human will. We see the move throughout the novel, uh, in which we get a number of different kinds of future wonders with quite a few canting in the direction of virtual world building. Scientists and technicians, for instance, control the weather, food is plentiful and synthetically manufactured, natural disasters, except for this freak avalanche, are averted through the wonders of technology and science. We read of a mimograph which can record thoughts directly onto paper, something that I keep hoping the Olsons would have perfected. <laughs> and citizens are entertained by telephonically and televisually transmitted stage plays delivered to their homes and rendered in what appeared to be a near surround sound in-home theater. I think most of us probably have that. There's even a global communication network. Keep in mind, this is a novel written in 1925 global communication network in which we see Ralph uh, using it to avert worldwide police force, uh, alert worldwide police forces about Alice's kidnapping by the crafty Martian. Bernsback offers us a vision of a nearly ideal technologized world, kidnappers aside, that's completely re-sculpted through science and technology. And the hero is, after all, a scientist, like many heroes of early science fiction. So if Huismont understood his novel, A Rebore, as a kind of dream in which an individual virtually controlled all aspects of his experience, then that virtuality is in some ways turned inside out in Ralph 1 to 4C for 1 plus to revision the entire planet as a virtual landscape. So there's a lot of scientific and technologically re-engineering uh, uh, re -engineering and controlling of nature here, as I've described. But what about art? Is there art or something aesthetic in this particular book? And there is. We can understand the recrafting of nature in some ways as an artificial invention, right? But the aesthetics of art have shifted. Indeed, the interesting thing about Ralph 1, 2, for C, for 1, plus, and its depiction of virtuality, is how we see the privileging of technological and scientific control over nature moving to contain and direct the category of art as well. So we hear early in the novel about a curious invention called a hypnobioscope, which through a series of attachments allows a sleeping individual to dream works of fiction. <laughs> this wonderful invention, invented by Ralph, transmitted the impulses of the wave line direct to the brain of the sleeping inventor, who thus was made to dream the Odyssey, for instance. How many of you would like to, you would like to absorb your fiction in your sleep. In Gernsback's future, even the realm of dreams is technologically controlled through the hypnobioscope with the dreamer picking a narrative to infiltrate his subconscious and entertain him throughout the night. The hypnobioscope returns at the end of the novel, curiously, to help save Alice, who unfortunately has been killed in the meantime by her kidnapper, the crafty Martian, before Ralph can save her. Ralph, however, knows exactly what to do. Here's the passage. Ralph had sent for a hypnobioscope, the headpieces of which they fastened to Alice's temples. They brought a number of roles, and from them Ralph chose one of the world's most beautiful love stories. It was the last trench in his desperate combat with nature. It was the supreme effort. It was the last throw of the dice in the game between science 
and death with the girl as the stakes. As the reel unrolled, Ralph found his burning, affixed his burning eyes on the closed ones of Alice as though he would drive by the very force of his will the impressions coming from the hypnobioscope deep into her brain. Then, while they watched with bated breath, the slight body of the operating table quivered almost imperceptibly as the water of a still pool is rippled by a passing zephyr. A moment later, her breast rose gently and fell again, and from the white lips came the suggestion of a sigh. The hypnobioscope playing, I, and we never hear what the one most wonderful love story is, but whatever it is, it channeled into Alice's dead brain by the hypnobioscope revives, revives her, it actually saves her. Now, if any of you are paying attention and you're really nerds like me, you will be flashing now on some of the last scenes in the first Matrix film, right? In which our hero, Neo, coming to his own death in the virtual world of the Matrix is brought back to life, how? By kiss, right? From the vinyl clad heroine. Interestingly, the hypnobioscope, the inducer of dreams, the purveyor of narratives, is the device through which Ralph saves Alice. And as in the last pages of Lost Hits of the Absolute Zero of Existence, we see art and science brought together, the aesthetic and the natural joined to overcome natural limitations in the pursuit of an ideal, life and love over the separation of death itself. Now, Lossitz kind of hints at these sorts of things. Gernsback actually shows them uh, in this sort of preposterous story. And yet, there is a difference here. The hypnobioscope, I argue, contains and directs the aesthetic experience, using it to achieve even further control over the natural, whether by controlling dreams or thwarting death. And indeed, controlling one's dreams through the hypnobioscope seems a particularly invasive attempt to control the potentially uncontrollable, the unconscious, rendering it yet just another landscape subject to technological pruning and shaping. And so there's a way in which what we see in Gernsback is the use of technology. Uh, certainly, it's directing a work of art, but that work of art completely contained within it. And Gernsback, like many science fiction writers at the time, understands his virtuality as fully fully about technological advancement and control over nature, even something as, as potentially uncontrollable as dreams, even death. Now, you get the versions of this throughout the 20th century. Brave New World, many of you I know have read that. There are feelies in Brave New World, movies that one can actually feel. Curiously, unlike Gernsback, Huxley understands those as a sign of degeneracy. Uh, and so sometimes those virtual experiences are associated not with the rise of science and technology and our the domination of the natural world, but actually of human depravity in some way. You also get a sense of this in the matrix itself. How many of you remember this scene? Matrix is telling my brain that it is juicy and delicious. After nine years, you know what I realize? All right, yeah, yeah, he doesn't care. Okay, he wants back in the Matrix. And so that's actually what happens. So this is another example of how Cypher, in this case, who is the evil character, wants back in the Matrix. And that level of, of virtuality and control, in this case, control over people, over humanity, is coded as bad. And in fact, it's often contrasted in the Matrix films with these lush scenes of uh, human orgy, primal, primitive human orgy. And so we have some separating out. So throughout all of the examples I've shown so far, what we get from 1884 to 1999 and beyond are two different versions of virtuality. A kind of utopic virtuality in which science and technology enhance 
the natural or even dominate the na nature so much that the aesthetic itself, art, is controlled within it. But we also get versions of dystopian virtuality in which science and technology potentially destroy the natural or at, or at odds with nature. And the aesthetic, in some ways, represents the artificiality of human intervention. In the scene with Cypher, for instance, as he's sort of just lovingly holding that bit of steak, medium rare, maybe. That's an aesthetic moment in the whole scene of this lovely restaurant. In fact, one of the bad uh, computer uh, artificial intelligence characters it's called the Merovingian, right? Do you remember him? He's vaguely French, right? So the French are behind all of this. Back to our more. So it's aestheticism is the problem. Artificiality and virtuality, they're bad. We don't need that. Now, obviously, the Matrix films come to their own conclusion. We won't go there. Instead, I want to go directly in my final minutes to Avatar, because I think Avatar gives us a really interesting version of all of the things I've been talking about. So quickly, in some important ways, Avatar romances the experiences of the virtual, both as an experience itself, as a virtual immersion film, at least visually, but also potentially sonically, and to some extent kinesthetically, in the vibrations felt through the soundtrack, but also in its dramatic content. As you know, the plot focuses primarily on the conflict between a human mining corporation on Pandora, an alien planet, and the resistance of the planet's indigenous pseudo-primitive population, the Navi. In an overt attempt to befriend and negotiate with them, human scientists use a consciousness uploading technology to inhabit the bodies of genetically grown Navi human hybrids and thus interact with them directly in their native habitat, which is otherwise poisonous to humans. Now, covertly, the principal male lead, Jake Sully, is a former Marine, is gathering intel on the Navi in their primary abode so that corporate military can destroy it and mine a rich deposit of unobtainium lying underneath it. In the process of infiltration, however, he learns that the Navi, he learns more about them, falls in love with the chief's daughter. There's a lot of love in these stories of virtuality. And he's acculturated into and accepted as one of the people and ultimately leads the resistance to the human assault in what some people have called dances with wolves in space. Along the way, we discovered that the primitiveness of the Navi is rather deceptive in that they can link to each other, to animals, and to the planet itself through a complex network of electrical chemical connections that interweave all living things together. They're also able to retain memories of past Navi. Inevitably, viewers are expected to identify with Jake and the Navi against the corporation, which is eventually banished from Pandora. Now, in terms of the tropes and figures that I've been tracing here, Avatar pits the technological, right, the mining, the corporation, and its association with heavy machinery, ravaging Pandora's natural beauty against the natural, pristine world of Pandora and its exotic flora and fauna. And that's interesting because in the logic of the film, we are asked to identify with the Navi and their home tree, who have represented as significantly closer to nature, more in touch with their natural world than the ravaging human corporate minions surrounded by their machinery and complex technology. So the nature of Pandora and the fight to protect it stands metaphorically in for our own ecological battles on Earth, there's no doubt. But that natural, the nature in Avatar, represented to us virtually in the film, is itself completely artificial. Its aesthetic charm captures our attention in part because its world is so much more lush, exotic, and unusual. Indeed, it's precisely the highly aestheticized artificiality of the world of Pandora, I would argue, that captivates and sustains attention, and perhaps is what led to so many people having PAD. We're even to some extent narratively propelled through the film by the aesthetic spectacle, wondering what things will look like next. In Manuel Castell's formulation, the world of make-believe has become the experience itself. In terms of the history of the representation of the virtual that I've been tracing, the experience of Avatar interestingly collapsed the aesthetics of the artificial into the natural, and the natural into the artificial. Even further, it fantasizes into the heart of the natural a great network through which individuals can link and upload memories. That is, the artificial and highly aestheticized natural in this case is actually a big networked computer. With Avatar, then, the artificial and the aesthetic 
are subsumed and conflated with the natural, which is itself subsumed in and conflated with the technological and the scientific. What does this highly aestheticized artifice tell us? Well, it gestures, perhaps, as artifice, to the make-believe nature of our ideals for our technologies. On the one hand, we're deeply skeptical of the uses to which many of our technologies have been put to change our world and displace and massacre whole populations, whole ecosystems, hence the corporate antagonists in the film. One, you know, we can even potentially trace those all the way back to Gernsback's Ralph 1 to Foresee for 1-2. It's Ralph out of control. On the other hand, we're deeply committed to those same technologies and our fantasies about their ability to connect us globally in mutual understanding, potentially, to retain, perhaps, the better part of who we are or who we want to be. An avatar's ceaseless naturalizing of those later technologies and fantasies, however, we miss them as fantasy while allowing ourselves to experience them as ideals. I might put it this way. Avatar is a contemporary version of Huisman's A Rebor, with the crucial difference that we are lulled into mistaking the aesthetics of the artificial, the lush, natural world of Avatar, for the sheer beauty of a fake world, for the natural. We assume, in, to enjoy the film, that this is nature, when in fact, it's completely artificial. That is, Pandora entices aesthetically, even as its artificiality is coded as natural. In the process, what is significantly shifted, I argue, is our relationship to the category of the artificial. In the late 19th century, Arubor asked that we appreciate the value of the artificial and the aesthetics, the ability to imagine other than what is, and to indulge in make-believe for their own sake, because they were valuable experiences artificiality as maybe the most important category of not just virtual experience, but of imagination. Avatar, though, invites us to see no difference between the artificial and the natural, or at least it fails to remind us of potential differences. What is lost here? I think that any attempt to trace these trajectories in the imagination and representation of the virtual has to take stock of alighted terms and conceptualizations. And so in my reading of a film like Avatar, what is uniquely missed is engagement with aesthetic artificiality as a critical concept. Now, this might be a convoluted way of suggesting that we might miss some interesting possibilities offered to us by the virtual to the extent that we fail to embrace the fact that the virtual is, as Mackenzie Wark reminds us, beyond an oasis. What is virtual and virtual reality? Not its mimetic qualities, but the potential to pass and go through and go beyond imitation. So to return to Avatar, what if we allow ourselves to experience technolo technologically enabled human interconnectivity? What if we allow ourselves to experience technologically enabled human interconnectivity, not as a naturally given ideal as it is in the world of Pandora, but as a rich human fantasy, as something admittedly artificial, but nonetheless desirable? In doing so, we risk the ontological surety of the natural, or at least we risk letting go of our fantasies of grounding such fantasy in the natural. But we would consequently have to come face to face with the prospect of making things up as we go along. But what might be gained? Avatar allows us to envision the bringing together of the aesthetic and the artificial through technology as opposed to focusing primarily on the technological determinism driven by systems of capital and the pursuit of the subjugation of the natural world. And that is something that's important in the film. It's anti-corporatism certainly is something that's very interesting, very important, and was uh, engaging for many different viewers. But the danger of Avatar is that we mistake the interconnectedness of the natural and that we reify it against the technological, delighting in the primitiveness of the Navi. The possibility offered in my understanding of Avatar is that the recognition of the kind of global human connectedness envisioned is actually unnatural. It is artificial, but it remains one of our most beautiful visions. And it may be one that we can collectively work toward, provided we bend our will toward the allocation of resources 
that make technological improvement of life a benefit for all, not just for a few. Indeed, re-understanding a vision of human collectivity and interconnectedness as artificial might allow us the opportunity to experiment with it in productive ways as opposed to residing in the fantasy of connectivity. We may not succeed, but I argue if we embrace the artificiality of our best visions, we will at least have to acknowledge that we are making choices, that we are engaged in the world of ethical decision making, not fully determined just by nature, not that we can blame our mistakes just on the natural. Thank you. Please. You can read your question. Yes, you can. <laughs> I read part of my paper. So. <laughs> Gary, please. What's beyond Avatar? Mm, that's a really, really good question. So, uh, how many of you are watching Westworld? What? Westworld? People watching Westworld, which I'm not going to talk about because I'm not fully caught up yet. But what's interesting is that there are a number of different kinds of. Um, not only movies, uh, television series, certainly books, and games that have come out that increasingly invite virtual experiences. And I think even something like Westworld, if you've been watching it, plays with a lot of the similar sets of ideas. It's like, what is at stake in the creation of artificial experiences, right? And Westworld is maybe intriguing in extending my argument, and then it much more boldly gets at the ethics of the creation of artificial, in this case, artificial beings. And the next project that I would love to present to you, in fact, I, I was sort of negotiating out with, with Judy about this because uh, the paper that I've just finished and, and, and publishing in just a couple of months is on artificial intelligences in virtual uh, environments and how they extend not only the experience of, of artificiality, but extend that ex uh, the experience of the ethics of engaging with artificial beings in virtual environments. And my primary reading in that relies uh, on the film Her, uh, which many of you may have seen, but also on a series of uh, sexual simulations as well, uh, including, uh, this is just to kind of give you a little teaser, I hope you'll invite me to come back next, <laughs> next quarter soon, including uh, an, an artificial intelligence that invites you to spank its uh, rather beefy buttocks. But first, but first, you have to negotiate uh, its limits with it. So it's interesting that not only in, in films like her, but you increasingly get uh, actual interactive environments in which we are invited, uh, fully, fully understanding that we're doing something which is artificial, even unnatural, uh, not to be kinky, but understanding the ethics, invited to really deeply consider the ethics of what it means to engage with our technologies in that manner. So there's a lot, a lot more to come. This really, I think of as sort of the, the initial historical genealogical grounding of at least getting the concepts that I'm interested in out uh, in the open. So thanks for your question. We have time for one more. Yeah. Oh, just one more? Oh, yeah. no. Well, it's, it, well you want the line. I know. OK, all right. <laughs> I do, too. Yes, sir. Um, what, what other way you can get uh, beyond here, this, yeah. the, 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 the separation between the artificial and, and the natural, uh, is to go to second nature mm -hmm. um, and to see the virtual, uh, and, and actually Avatar would be great to yeah. read this through as the cultural, right. uh, that which is, uh, it doesn't partake really of either. Um, so, yeah. so I guess my question is yeah. what, where does, um, or, or does this kind of work help us to to then look back uh, beyond the, 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 the questions of uh, virtual reality as technology, right. but virtual reality as, as, as culture, social life in general. Absolutely. And as a humanist, that's exactly what I'm interested in doing. So, and, and part of why I'm interested in sharing this work with my colleagues in informatics is that I want to know not, I mean, I, I, can, I can do lots of readings of cultural objects and, and things like films and television shows and um, you know, kinky programs. But I'm really interested also in platforms. And, and so uh, I appreciate your, your comment about sort of the, the, the nature of culture in this, in this kind of work. But I'm just as interested in, in the platforms that enable the work as, as well. But yes, for me, this is what's at stake ultimately is really trying to think through how have we mobilized different rhetorics of nature essentially to short circuit, if I can borrow a technological metaphor, Interesting conversations about ethics 
uh, and choices about how we use our technologies. And so for me, Avatar really pit is, is situated right at that rich cultural moment in which, wow, we're really disturbed by some of the uses to which we've put our technologies. And yet, they also offer us some of our greatest potential for uh, ethical connectivity, for connecting with people in ethically productive ways and generative ways. And so the, the tragedy of the film, in my view aesthetically, is that it's a, it, is, it can't get beyond the science, technology, nature divide. And in, to the extent to which we can embrace culture as a set of artificial constructs, we will get closer and closer to the ethical content of the creation of those constructs. Does that help? Yeah. I want to hear Aaron's question. Aaron. Um, thank you first for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. it. Made me imagine all sorts of great things. Uh, I guess part of the narrative that you you put out right was uh, this the story about how um, a, a move from understanding technology right in a more uh, naturalistic utopian sense to this artificial or artificiality in a sort of utopian sense to yeah. artificiality in a sort of dystopian right. sense. I think would probably be more accurate. Yeah. I guess I was wondering like. What would you say some of maybe the cultural or political movements happening alongside this that might have encouraged this sort of uh, change in motif? Yeah, you know, ab absolutely. So um, what's interesting, of course, I mean, Garen's back writing in, in, in the 20s, uh, uh, Huxley then in the 30s. Um, there's are two interesting moments, and you get science, a lot of science fiction, which is so invested in the science is hero, technological determinism, uh, technological domination. Um, and then what's the difference, of course, between the, the, the 20s and the 30s? You know, to time of relative global economic expansion and then terrible global depression, right? And I think there's absolutely mappable you know, socio-historical and political content onto what Gernsback is doing and Huxley's doing both in the 20s and the 30s. But I think we also can see that easily in the 90s as well with a film, with a film like Matrix, right, in the in sort of late 90s, really getting into uh, kind of technological expansion. Um, I, I'm, I'm less, I'm, I'm remembering less well the, uh, the later Matrix films, but I do think it's interesting that the sort of the, the Matrix is, is a lot like Avatar in my mind in that the, the romance of the, the artificial and the, the virtual is sort of weird in that it's split between the, the, the machines that have completely overtaken us, right, and just usurped human authority so much so that humans are essentially just batteries, right, just used as power sources, uh, kept pacified by this virtually immersive experience. But those films move towards a similar kind of uh, reconciliation between humans and all of their natural glory and then the machines. I mean, there is a sort of movement towards a, a truce, a kind of an attempt to come to terms with um, the machines that we actually have created, which we worry might get far beyond us. And I think that that move in, 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 in the late 90s is absolutely mappable on to the sort of expansion of global networks of you know, communications technologies and the sense that we have now networks that we have, we carry around devices that are beyond our real ability to understand them. Uh, most people's ability, I mean people here in this room understand them, but most people's ability to really understand them. So I think these sorts of films sort of speak to a real tense set of relationships, a sort of an appreciation of the power of these machines but also some, some worry, uh, some anxiety about what they actually can do yeah, I was thinking, or might do. I was thinking when you had that like clean delineation of 1999, right, like Y2K. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. of skepticism around technology. I, absolutely. For those of us who live who are conscious through Y2K, you know, we, did, we thought the world would end you know, in 2000. We didn't wait. No, we'd have to wait until 2016. So. <laughs> okay, thank you so much.